Hallelujah. Come on, all of this is for him. Come on, every praise, every honor, every adoration. Lord, we exalt you today. Lord, we haven't gathered here for any other reason but to lift you up, to magnify you. Hallelujah, Lord. And we know that you are in this place. So healing is here. Salvation is here. Deliverance is here, God. Hallelujah, Lord. We know that everything changes because of you, Jesus. Oh, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Come on, why don't you clap your hands to him one more time? Why don't you lift him up in this place? Hallelujah. Everything changes because of Jesus. Come on, my circumstance changes because of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Amen. He is in this place today. So that means that everything that they just sang about is in this place today. Healing, deliverance, salvation is here today because Jesus is here. And I'm thankful that he's here. I'm thankful that it's not relying upon our power, upon anything that we can conjure up. But it's his might, his power, and his spirit that is present in this place today to do a work in your life and in my life. Amen. I'm so thankful to be in his presence. Amen. I'm so thankful for everyone that's here today, for all of our guests that are here with us today. We welcome you today. I'm so glad that you are here to worship with us. And we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 2 this morning. And I realize that this is still part of the Christmas story. And uh, we have heard some fantastic messages on a Sunday and a Wednesday. But on a Sunday, we have seen a star. We've seen Bethlehem. We have seen the manger. I'm thankful that we can see those things. They still impact our life. Amen. And I'm, I'm going to start in the Christmas story, the, the nativity story. But I'm not going to finish up there. I know that Christmas is over and <laughs> the, uh, the wrapping paper has been burned. Hopefully nothing else with it. I, uh, it was a little bit windy. We opened our gifts on Christmas Eve. It was a little bit windy that evening. Of course, that's always the best time to burn paper. So I thought, I'll burn it in the driver. Then I thought, nah, I'll probably blow up my truck if I burn right behind my truck. So I took it over to where we burn other stuff. And there's, well, I caught the whole pile on fire. So, But it was all good. It burned out in the field, so that's fine. I did catch the field on fire about two months ago, but that's, that's another story. But we're going to read from Matthew chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 9. And it says, when they, speaking of the wise men, it says, when they had heard the king, speaking of Herod, they departed... And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And I want to preach to you from that last verse, from this title, Departing Another Way. I'd ask that you pray with me one more time as we enter into his word today. Lord Jesus, we come before you. Lord, we're honored and privileged to be in your presence, to be gathered together. And Lord, we're thankful for your presence that we feel that you are in this place. We're thankful for your word which speaks to us. And Lord, I pray that your spirit, your word would speak to us, Lord, that you would wash us Cleanse us, transform us through the power of your word and your spirit today, God. Anoint our ears to hear your voice, Lord. We want to hear you today, God. We give you praise and glory for it, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning. In the story of Jesus' birth, the wise men appear in the story almost as a surreal addition to it. The amount of details left out about these men only adds to the mystery surrounding them. We don't know how long they traveled. We don't know why they were the only people to act upon the sighting of the star. We don't know 
their religious background. We don't even know how many there were or when they arrived in Bethlehem. Much has been given about or spoken of, surmised about them, about even their arrival. Some feel that they did not uh, arrive when Jesus was still in the stable, but we know that Jesus was in Bethlehem roughly 18 months when he was born. And so there's debate about when they even showed up in Bethlehem. And because of this, much mythology has arisen out of their story, much fiction, even down to the supposition that there were three wise men because of the three gifts brought. All the information it gives us is there was wise men from the east. There could have been three. There could have been 500 that showed up that night. They were foreigners. They were unversed in the Jewish religion, yet they brought the most worthy gifts that night, not even realizing the prophetic nature of the gifts that they gave, symbolizing Jesus' kingship, his sacrifice, and that his burial would take place, but he would rise again. They are also, they also seem to be the least surprised in the story about finding a king born in a stable in Bethlehem. We judge by their gifts that they were wealthy people, and yet we don't find where they question at all that a star has led them to a stable and there is a king lying in a feeding trough. We are given no clue as to their thoughts as they approach the stable, yet they show no hesitation in, in continuing to present their gifts to the baby. I don't know, again, we're given no uh, record of what they thought, but I, I wonder if they began to rethink their gifts as they approached the stable. They knew they were heading to something magnificent, so they grabbed the most precious of things, but as they're walking up to the stable, I wonder if they began to reconsider, should we really give someone in a stable gold? They present us with many questions, many unknowns, yet there are some things we can gather from their inclusion in this most miraculous of all stories. And the first feature that we consider is not unique to the wise men, but it is highlighted by them. And it is this, that all of us must come to Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, the wise men, they, the main characters of the story, they all had this in common, that they had to come to Bethlehem. Could Mary and Joseph have had the child and it still be from the tribe of David? Yes, because Joseph was of the tribe of David, but they needed to be in Bethlehem. Could the angels have told the shepherds that something special had happened in the nearby town and leave it there? Yes, but they told them to go to Bethlehem and see. Could the wise men have received a message from God in a dream just like after they had seen Jesus? Yes, but a star led them to Bethlehem. Each of these characters in the story had this one thing in common. It wasn't their social background. It wasn't their common hobbies and interests. It wasn't their place of origin, their race, or their economic status. The one thing they had in common was that they all came to Bethlehem and there encountered the king of kings. Now let me say God does and can appear in any number of ways to people. An angel appeared to Mary, Joseph and the shepherds. The wise men saw a star, but everything led them to an encounter with Jesus. And it is no different today. You must encounter a Savior in Bethlehem. It doesn't matter what other religious experience you had. It doesn't matter what else you may have encountered in your life. It doesn't matter if an angel appeared to you, if a star brought you there. We all must come to Bethlehem and kneel in front of the King. We all must present ourselves before Jesus. Now let me say, does this invalidate every other experience that you may have had in your life? No. But we, what we need to realize is that every other experience that those characters had, the shepherds, the wise men, Mary and Joseph, it was pointing them towards Bethlehem. It was pointing them towards that moment. What does that mean for us today? You can have any experience you want spiritually, and that doesn't mean that it's invalid. It doesn't mean that it's nothing. But let me remind you that every experience you have is leading you to Jesus Christ. It is leading Leading you to a savior. In fact, in Jesus' own words, in John chapter 10 and verse 7, then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. 
I want to tell you today, every path is not valid. Every belief is not right. You have to understand that you must go through Bethlehem. You must go through Jesus. I don't care what experience you've had. It should lead you to Jesus Christ. He is the door, and it is through him that you must enter today. Jesus further clarifies what that means entering in through the door. In John chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. To enter through the door into the kingdom, you must be born again of the water and of the Spirit. You must enter the door that way. There is no other way to get into the kingdom except repentance and baptism and the infilling of the Holy Holy Ghost and every experience you've had up until now has been pointing you to that one experience. And the good news is, is that you can encounter Jesus today. You can encounter Bethlehem today. There may not be an angel. There may not be a heavenly choir or a star. But he is no less here today than he was as a baby that they all visited that night. He is here today. He is present today. He is able to save today. Oh, I'm thankful that I have a Savior. I'm thankful that I can approach a Savior. I'm thankful that I know the door today. I'm thankful that I know the way of salvation today. We also consider this, that every person who came to Bethlehem that night and encountered Jesus, we find something else similar to all of them. They all left Bethlehem. None of them stayed there. We find that Mary and Joseph perhaps stayed the longest, but they eventually left Bethlehem as well. The wise men, they left. The shepherds went and told everyone they found, but eventually they returned to their fields. Mary and Joseph left and went to Egypt. Something we must understand is that we must encounter Bethlehem. You can't, you can't uh, start your journey any other way but encountering Bethlehem, and that means coming to Jesus through a new birth experience. But I hope you, re- you are reminded of this this morning, that while you must come to Bethlehem, you are not called to remain in Bethlehem. Yes, God calls us to salvation. Yes, He draws us with His Spirit. And yes, we, it is vital and absolutely necessary that we come to Bethlehem. But then He gives us the Holy Ghost, and He calls us to go from Bethlehem, that you cannot stay in that place. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember when I had a new birth experience, and it was a wonderful experience, and I enjoyed it, and it was, everything looked great. There, there was no enemies that night. There was, there was no harsh words that could be spoken that night. Everything was just glorious. You loved everyone. You loved everything. Till the next morning. No, I'm kidding. Hopefully it lasted longer than that. But sometimes we, we think, man, it would be so good to, to, to go back to that moment when it felt that newness, when everything was just, uh, uh, it seemed so alive and so fresh. And, and, but God doesn't call us to stay in Bethlehem. Sometimes we think it would just be great to live in that initial experience, but I am called to go from that experience. And what we need to understand is that Bethlehem is not the end. Bethlehem is the starting point in your walk with God, that you must come through Bethlehem, but that is not where it ends. You begin your journey at Bethlehem. Paul states in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12, and I've mentioned this verse many times, Paul says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. Simply put, Paul says, I was saved, and I'm glad I was saved, but God saved me for a reason. God saved me for a purpose and I'm going to reach and strive and work until I accomplish what he called me to do. Oh, make no mistake, your salvation is essential. That's why Jesus came to this earth. But if salvation is all that you have experienced, you have not received all that he wants to give you. You have not experienced all that he wants to do through you. He saved you for a reason. He saved you for a purpose. He wants to do something in you and through you. He wants you to leave Bethlehem and take what you have experienced and go and do something powerful for him. God didn't save you so that you could come to church once or twice a week. I don't know if that's a little harsh or not. I think you should come to church. 
But God didn't save you just so you can come to church a few times a week. He saved you and transformed you and extended grace and mercy. He showed unfailing love to you so that you could then go and do the same. Paul gives an account of his conversion when he is speaking to the Roman rulers and he states these words that God spoke to him when he was converted in Acts chapter 26 in verse 18. He says this is what was told him by Jesus. He said your calling is to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. God has called us to Bethlehem, but we need to understand that we are sent from there and God has called you to leave Bethlehem to go back where you came from but understand that you are not the same as when you left yes the shepherds went back to the hills yes the wise men went back to their country but they did not go back the same way they went back as light in the darkness they went back preaching Christ crucified. They went back talking about there's a power that can turn you from sin unto light in this world. God has called you not just to go back to work, but you have experienced something. He's called you to be a light in your workplace, in your school, in your family. God has called you to share about the forgiveness of sins that you received, the transformation in your life. God has called you to share the inheritance you have received wherever you go. God is calling you to leave Bethlehem today. I can't be satisfied staying in Bethlehem. And while these ideas can be applied to several characters in the, t- in the nativity story, we find they apply to all the main characters. I want to draw your attention to some details surrounding the wise men specifically, and especially to their departure from Bethlehem. Again, Not much is known about the wise men. Not much is known about their origin point. There's been a lot of supposition about where they came from, where they say we have seen his star in the east, and and so we know that they have come somewhere west of Israel. We don't know anything really about the region they came from. But we do know whether it was the star leading them or the road that they were on, they stopped in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is located about six miles north of Bethlehem. And this was probably also the location of the main roads. They usually build the main roads between main towns. That's why there's uh, uh, an interstate between uh, Salem and Centraea because the main road is between main towns, right? Not really. But if you want to go from city to city, generally there's an interstate. There's, that's, that's the more well-traveled way. It made sense to go through Jerusalem from a traveling standpoint. I don't know if you're the kind of person that just hops in the vehicle and says, well, we'll just uh, decide how, we'll just, we'll just drive and see when we get there. Yeah, some people say, oh my. Other people are like, yeah, that sounds good. But there comes a point when you're like, are we going to get there? <laughs> So I remember, uh, you know, back in the day, you'd pull out the big road atlas, right? That was, that was imperative to have that, that big road atlas that you could follow. And there was different colors for the different roads. And then I thought I was really uh, uh, technologically savvy when I would print out instructions, directions from MapQuest. So then it's not a whole atlas. It's just six pieces of paper you're flipping through, <laughs> If you don't staple it, then you get it all mixed up, and now we just put our phone there. <laughs> then we about end up crashing because it's telling us which way to turn, and we're trying to figure out what to do. Well, we try, many times we try to find the, the best route there, and a lot of times the best route involves the best paved roads. You don't want to be, uh, I, I know that there's, there's, we can get... On our road from our house, we can make one turn and go on Tontai Road, and we can end up all the way on that road that, is, uh, that goes, I don't know what road it's called, but it's that road. You know that road by the old stump that's got the sign pointing to the right? It's the road that you turn off to get into Boulder Campground. That road right there. You know, you can kind of come from Weedy Kemper's there, now we're talking, and we can go all the way down and get to Boulder there. But there's a section of the road that's a rock road. It's a real rock road. There's just a section there, and uh, you know th- that road's a little bit different. You gotta go a little bit slower. 
If I'm, in my, if I'm in my truck, I don't have to go any slower. I just hit it and just go for it, right? So that's, that's what a truck is for, is to hit the potholes hard, right? But you got to go a little bit slower because it's not the main road. It's not as well kept. And so it made sense, I'm sure, that even though there wasn't paved roads like we have today, the main roads would have been more kept up. And so they go to Jerusalem. Again, whether it was the star or whether it just from a traveling standpoint, it was the logical place to go. We read about their encounter with Herod and he asked them to stop back by on the way home and let them know if they found this king they were searching for. Now even if Herod had not made his request, we can begin to look at this and I know there's a little bit of supposition involved, but going back through Jerusalem would have been a logical way to return. It was only six miles Bethlehem and Jerusalem separated. And so going back through Jerusalem, there probably was a better road that way. It, it probably provided a place where, you know what, we could start from Bethlehem. We'll go back through Jerusalem. We'll pick up any provisions we need. We'll pick up some Snickers bars, some, some soda for the road, a big swig. Right? <laughs> I found when I was, uh, when I was uh, dating my wife, I was driving back and forth from Indianapolis to here, Salem, and sometimes I'd get off work at 2 in the morning and drive here, and Gary really appreciated that. <laughs> and I'd, I'd usually leave, and, and leave work and get a, a, a big Mountain Dew to drink on the way, or sometimes I'd have to leave Salem, and, and I'd stop by Huck's and get a big drink of Mountain Dew, get a one of the big swigs of Mountain Dew before I head back. And I thought, this will keep me awake, but there's one surefire thing that will keep you awake more than Mountain Dew. And that is when you have the Mountain Dew sitting between your legs, just when you decide to hit the interstate, and you decide to take a drink and pick it up, and the lid is not on right, and you lose 44 ounces in your lap. That keeps you awake a whole lot better than the Mountain Dew. But perhaps Jerusalem would have been a logical way to return. The best roads led that way. It, it was a place to get provisions. It was, perhaps you could say, the logical and expected route back home for them to reach their destination of home. It wasn't just that Herod had said, come back this way. It was also a fairly logical choice when you looked at their travel plans for them to go back through Jerusalem. Perhaps you are here today and you've experienced the call to Bethlehem and you have encountered Jesus. And again, if you have not, you can encounter him today. You may even have come to the realization that you were not called to stay in Bethlehem. Perhaps like the wise man, you even have an idea of what your destination is. Maybe you have felt the call of God in your life. Maybe you have felt the pull to do more, to be more for him. Perhaps God has given you some direction of where you need to go spiritually after Bethlehem. Maybe he's called you to teach Bible studies. Maybe he's called you to help in children's ministry or youth work. Or maybe you've even felt the call to preach or to reach out to others more in a particular way because you realize Bethlehem is not where I'm supposed to stay, but I need to leave Bethlehem. And while we may not have all the details worked out on this journey, we have a destination and some perhaps expected idea of how it will be achieved in our life or where God will take us. And then all of a sudden, God appears in a dream and tells us to depart another way. Suddenly, we're thrown for a loop. I don't know if you've ever been in the middle of that expression, thrown for a loop. Perhaps your expectations all of a sudden as God speaks to you in a new way, perhaps your expectations become a little jumbled. You are caught trying to figure out what am I going to do next because I was planning on going to Jerusalem, but now God is telling me to take a different way. I need to pull out the atlas. I need to pull out a map and see what other roads will lead me to the destination besides the one through Jerusalem. We trust God, but our expectations, our plans have been challenged in our life. I don't know if you've ever found yourself in that place where you trust God, and yet there's still some doubt, there's still some trepidation, there's still some wonder about how can He do, how can I accomplish. The path we find ourselves on is not the main path, and perhaps you found yourself off the main path in your life. There aren't regular stops. In fact, we wonder if the road we are on is even a road sometimes. You hit that little stretch on Tontai that's just a rock road, and you wonder, am I still on the right path? 
There aren't any moments where they're easy. It's in these moments we begin to question where God is, where his purpose is in everything, if somehow we missed it in our life. As I was preparing for today, in fact, not just for today, but thinking about knowing that this year was coming to an end, I began to think back to almost one year ago. I preached the last Sunday of last year as well, 2019. Remember 10 years ago? And I preached this, hindsight is 2020, and I apologize for using that title. I talked about not knowing what a year would bring. That all we have as we approach a new year, we have expectations, we have thoughts, we have plans, but we don't really know. But all we have is hindsight. All we have is to look at what God has done before and believe that if He did it before, He'll do it again. And if He kept me in 2018 and 2019, He'll keep me in 2020. That if I trust him because of what he's done, then I can trust him in the future. (laughs) And I finished talking about expectations. Having greater expectations. That if God did it before, he can do it again. And if he can do it again, he can do it even greater. I don't know if you remember, we were talking about revival. We were talking about great things we expected God to do. What powerful things were going to happen in 2020. What amazing things God was going to do. I quoted these statistics. I'd found them 2017 through 2019. We had 57 people baptized in those three years. I'm thankful for what God is doing in our midst. In 2017 through 2019, we had 75 filled with the Holy Ghost in three years. And it's in my notes from a year ago saying that if God did that in three years, why couldn't God do it in one year? And in 2020, God could fill 100 people with the Holy Ghost, that he could bapt- we could see 100 people baptized. And as I preached on December 29th, 2019, I knew as I was preaching that we were going to be launching a plan to start three new preaching points on Pentecost Sunday, that we were believing God to move, to work, to touch in Carlisle, in Iuka, in Alma, and here in Salem. That's what I was in my head. That's what I was preaching. That's that's what I was sharing on that Sunday almost one year ago today. Little did I know that in just a few months, Brother Gene and I would just be preaching to each other. We'd be sharing a word with each other and hoping someone was watching. Little did I know what was going to take place. And as I stand here today, almost exactly a year later, we have no preaching points. The one that we had going had to shut down. Couldn't do outreach in COVID. You don't want to answer the door. Now, I do want to say I rejoice for those who have been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost in the middle of 2020, in the middle of everything, that we had nine baptized and three filled with the Holy Ghost while we're online and all this confusion, everything going on. I'm thankful that God still moves and still touches, still fills with the Holy Ghost. And I do want to say I don't discount any individual experience at all because, man, you could discount that one person on the road to Damascus and there was only one saved out of a whole crowd, but that one person was Saul who would become Paul that would share the gospel to the Gentile word. So I can't discount any salvation experience. I can't discount it at all. But I do look at it and say that's the lowest annual total since I don't know when. We don't even have digital records from the last time that happened. We were believing God to double the previous three years. <laughs> we ended up departing 2019 on a different path, departing another way. The path we ended up on was not the expected or planned path. But two things must be pointed out. The first is God was in control of the path back then for the wise men, and God is still in control of the path today. 
God knew what he was doing back then when he said, I'm going to take you away from Jerusalem. I'm going to take you on a way you never expected. And God still knows today exactly what he is doing. I may have doubts. I may have questions. I may have fears. I may not understand. But I do know that I can trust God in the middle of every circumstance. I can trust him for the path that I'm on. That I can keep obeying him. That I can keep believing his word. David puts it best when he states, when he talks about the path in Psalm chapter 23. It's a familiar verse, but he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I know that he is still with me on this path. I'm not talking about when I go my own way and I do my own thing, but when I follow his voice and find myself in the wilderness with my hopes waning, with expectations disappearing, yet I know I heard his voice. And it feels like I'm in the valley of the shadow of death. I'm going to stand and with certainty say, I fear no evil. Because God, you are still with me. You are still in control. You still hold all things in your hand. Oh, I'm thankful that I can trust him with the path. I'm thankful that I can trust him in the middle of every circumstance in my life. The second thing I want to bring out. Is that the path for the wise men changed that night. All of their plans were thrown awry in an instant. But I want to remind you of this. The destination was never in doubt. The destination was never in doubt. You see, they still were heading for the same place. It says they were heading home. And God said, I want you to take a different way home. They may not have understood the path. They may not have recognized all the danger that was there. But they knew the destination was never in doubt. And I want to tell you today, standing here almost one year later, that the destination is not in doubt today. I know the path has been different. But revival is still the destination. Souls repenting is still the destination. People being baptized is still the destination. People receiving the Holy Ghost is still the destination. In fact, it's just as true today as it was on December 29th, 2019. The prophecies of revival are just as true today. And I want to encourage you, do not let the destination become blurred because you're on a different path. As a church, as individuals, don't let the destination become doubt. God has still called you. God has still a purpose for your life. God still wants to do something in this community. The destination is never in doubt. If you're struggling as an individual because the call of God didn't go the way that you thought this year, I want to challenge you. The destination of your calling is still true. If God gave you promises and they seem farther than ever because of the path we walked on, let me tell you the destination of the promise is not in doubt. I know the path that we are on is not the expected one. I know it feels naturally and spiritually like I may be in the valley of the shadow of death. But I also know this. God is not the author of confusion. God still holds it in his hand. God is still leading. God is still guiding. And even though I may have doubts, God doesn't have doubts. And he's not confused today. You see, when my path gets confusing, there's one thing I can do. When doubts begin to challenge and I begin to think maybe there's a little confusion here and God may not know what he's doing, I need to do one thing and that's return my eyes to the destination. Yes, I'm still called. Yes, I still have a purpose. Yes, God still has greater revival for this community and for this church. Yes, God still wants revival in communities surrounding us. Yes, God still wants us to start our preaching points and reach out more than ever. Yes, God still has all of that in plan and in his purpose for us. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13. The author of Hebrews gives us some insight into how the heroes of faith viewed these things. Hebrews 11, 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. That's a powerful verse. 
As we look at it, and I'm sure you've heard that verse before, Hebrews 11 is a favorite chapter in this church, and so I'm sure that you have heard those before. But they saw the promises afar off. And I don't know if you think their path took a deviation at all, but to me, when I look at that, they all died in faith. It seems to me like there was a deviation, perhaps, from what I would expect to happen in the story. In fact, it says they did not receive the promises. But I'm telling you today that the promise may not have been received, but you can still be persuaded of the promises. The callings may not have happened like you thought, but you can still embrace the call of God. God may have called you to depart another way, but you can still remain steadfast in faith and confess, you know what? I'm not of this world. I'm not for this world. And my faith is going to remain secure in God. God still has a destination for us. It has never changed. And so amidst all the doubt, amidst all the confusion, amidst everyone trying to find a way and trying to figure out what to do, I want to lift my eyes to the destination again. I want to lift my eyes to the field one more time. I want to lift my eyes to what God wants to do in our midst one one more time. And I may not understand how he's going to do it. I may not understand how he's going to accomplish everything. But I'm going to trust that the destination has never changed. (laughs) And I can't leave Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, all by itself because I've got to read the next few verses. Verse 14, it says, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. I want to remind someone today that the destination of heaven hasn't changed either. Oh, I know your circumstances have changed, but there is a heavenly country waiting for you today. I know the path may be tough right now. It may have taken you the back way. It feels like you're in the wilderness. It may have left you feeling lost and without hope, and there'll be plenty of chances to return to where you came from. But I want to encourage you today, keep seeking that heavenly destination. Keep your eyes on heaven. In the middle of everything, just keep believing. You may be afar off, but I'm persuaded. I confess. I embrace that God is still moving and working. Oh, I want heaven to be my home. So if God tells me to depart a different way, I will because I know the destination hasn't changed. I know the course of life may take its twists and turns, but heaven is still my home. I'm here to encourage individuals today, to encourage this church that God may have called us to depart another way, to take another path, and it may seem confusing and leave us in doubt. It may leave us wondering, but that doesn't lessen His plans for your life. It doesn't lessen the promises of God in your life. It doesn't lessen the calling of God in your life. It doesn't lessen the purpose of God in your life and in this church today. Oh, I'm looking forward to what God has in store for us because I know there's a destination. I know there's revival. And I know it may not look how I think it was going to look, but I know God has called us and he has a purpose for us. And so I'm going to confess and believe and trust one more time in him today. And as I close this morning, the music may come. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews is a great book if you've never read it. There's a lot of good stuff in there. His life takes its twists and turns. And I think really, I don't know how many of you have heard, throughout the years, we don't know what to expect tomorrow. You don't know what tomorrow holds. And we all know that, but the reality of that is pretty tough to put into our life until this year (laughs) that we really were faced with we don't know what tomorrow holds you know way back when there was it was a daily thing what's going to happen today try and make plans and it seemed like you know we we're talking about what to do with church and stuff and two months away seemed like forever like what are we going to do this week and then you make plans and you got to change the plans for this week (laughs) and it seems like the path keeps changing and You know God has spoke. See, that's the thing, is you know God has spoke. I know there's moments in my life when we've all made dumb choices. 
God has told us one thing and we've done something else. That's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about when God speaks to you and you know God spoke to you. And you start walking and believing and trusting. And you know that feeling when God speaks to you and says to do something that you feel like God spoke to me now. I can do it. I can accomplish because I know that greater is he that's within me. I know all these things. Through him anything's possible. And then you realize you're on the rock road on Tantai. In fact, I was doing a, did a little work this year for the census. So if you're against the census, well, it's fine. <laughs> I encountered one, one gentleman, one fine gentleman in a back field somewhere <laughs> who uh, voiced several choice F words towards me as a bureaucrat. <laughs> I said, you know what? We had a good conversation. Now, he did continue with the expletives, but before long, he told me more information than I ever wanted to know. I was like, can I not quit talking to you here? <laughs> I took this one road, and I was trusting the GPS. I was trusting it with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I ended up on a rock road, Ended up on a rock road that had grass growing up the middle. And then ended up on a grass road. And then I just ended up in a field. Finally at the field, I was like, I don't think this is the right way. I trusted to a point. I was like, I got to turn around. <laughs> so it gave me another way and it did the exact same thing to me. <laughs> but those moments when you hear the voice and, and, and you believe the voice, it's what you're supposed to do. And you end up in the middle of a field. I didn't miss the turn. This is what it told me to do. And sometimes with God, it's that way. I, I know I didn't miss it. God told me to do this. And it went from a country road to a rock road to a cow path. I want to remind you the destination is not in doubt. The real thing, though, is in Hebrews chapter 6. The writer pens these words that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. I don't know if at any point this year you needed an anchor of the soul. I don't know if at any point while you're sitting in your lazy boy this year watching your 15th Sunday online, you needed a little bit of an anchor in your soul. Some uncertainty, some doubt, some confusion begins to creep in. But I'm asking you here today to have faith again. But I'm not asking you to have faith in the promises. I'm not asking you to have faith in the calling, both personal and of this church. I'm not asking you to have faith in your expectations of what you believe God can do again. I'm not asking you to have faith in any plan that's presented. But I'm challenging you to do what the author of Hebrews says. I'm challenging you to allow your faith in God to be strengthened today. I'm challenging you to do what the author says in verse 19. He says that that hope lies within the veil. And I'm challenging you to enter beyond the veil today. Now, I'm thankful that when Jesus died, that veil was rent. And, and now we have access that we can enter beyond the veil whenever he won. But he's writing to the Jews who get that analogy of going behind the veil. And, and, and I hope that you catch that today. That that's where the hope, the anchor of the soul lies, is beyond the veil. That's where his presence dwelt. That's where the priests came to encounter God. And you know what? When they encountered God, the promises, the callings, the expectations, they all paled when they entered the presence of God. 
You see, because I know those things are all powerful and, and him reassuring me of certain things, that's fine and, and we need that every so often. But if I catch sight of God today, then all of a sudden the doubts begin to fade away because I'm reminded of who God is and that he's greater than any confusion. He's greater than any doubt. I may feel like I'm lost and alone, but he is greater than all of those things. And when I catch sight of him, all of a sudden, the calling that God has in my life and for this church doesn't seem so far. All of a sudden, the promises that seem so far off. When I catch sight of Jesus one more time, when I get lost in his presence, when I enter beyond the veil, I realize what the real anchor of my soul is. It's Jesus in my life. And yes, he's called me to do more and be more. But oh, if I could just catch a glimpse of him again today if I could just enter his presence again today you see when I catch sight of him everything begins to fade in comparison oh when we catch sight of him as a church 2020 doesn't seem like a derailment of our plans at all everything that we expected and hoped for and believed when we catch sight of him as a church again 2020 doesn't seem lost it doesn't seem hopeless no in fact it's the opposite all of a sudden we have an anchor of hope that he's still faithful through everything when we catch sight of him, we begin to realize that yes, there's still a harvest. Yes, there's still revival. Yes, there's still souls in this community when I simply step beyond the veil. And I'm here to challenge you today, to encourage you today, that you have hope in the middle of everything. As we, we're going to do it all this time and throughout society, we're going to look back and look ahead, and we're going to feel things naturally and spiritually. But what will keep you anchored is hope in Jesus Christ today, entering into his presence one more time today as we stand this morning. I want to remind someone today, in the midst of confusion, in the midst of doubt, you can trust him that the destination hasn't changed. We can trust him as a church that he holds all things in his hands. We can trust him and believe him that he is still in control. But more importantly, we have access to him today. And see, really, when I don't know what's going on or what's happening or what's taking place, really, where do I need to be? I need to be in his presence. In fact, it was Isaiah the prophet. Everything's going wrong in the nation. Everything's happening. And in chapter 6, what happens? He enters the temple and he sees the Lord high and lifted up. And all of a sudden, everything just fades away. He says, woe is me, I am undone. <laughs> he wasn't undone because of circumstances. He wasn't undone because of sin. He wasn't undone because he didn't know where he was going. No, all of a sudden, the presence of God did that in his life. And he was laid bare. And when I'm laid bare before God, all of a sudden, hope can flood my soul again. When everything else fades away, I find that anchor that I have been looking for. I wonder right now if you can lift your hands and begin to pray right now. Come on, if you can begin to lay aside. I know this year hasn't gone how anyone could ever have imagined, how anyone could ever have planned, but I have an anchor of hope this morning. And Scripture tells me where it is. It's when I step into His presence. It's when I step into that holy of holies. It's when I step into that glory place that all of a sudden everything else begins to fade away. And the struggles of the path, the uncertainty, the confusion, they pale in comparison when I see His face, when I feel His presence, when He begins to surround me. Oh, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we don't know why we had plans and, and we thought revival was going to happen a certain way. But Lord, I know I need to get in your presence. And when I'm in your presence, I'll see a harvest again. I'll, be, I'll believe in the revival again. Lord, I'll know that you have it all in your hands. Come on, in your own life as well. Perhaps God had spoke to you and this was the year you were going to get involved and then ministry quit in church. All of a sudden, you couldn't do anything. You know what? God knows. Get in his presence again. 
find that anchor of hope one more time in your life. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Oh, that's it. That's it. Begin to call on him right now. Begin to call on him. Come on, get in his presence one more time. He's here today. You have access to his throne room today. Come on, take advantage of what he's done for you, that he's made a way for you today. Oh, they're getting ready to sing, and I'm going to open this altar. If you simply want to come and get in his presence today, if you want to experience his glory today, I'm inviting you to come to this altar today as they begin to sing. If you want an anchor of hope, if you want to make things sure in your life, I'm inviting you to this altar today. Come on, if you've never experienced Bethlehem, today is the day that you can experience him for the first time. Oh, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we need you today, God. 